James Avon. I was in the 8th Air Force. There were four of us that owned three small planes that we flew all the time anyway. And uh, I had an interest in flying, so I just automatically chose the Air Force. I didn't get any flying done, but uh, at least I was close to it. I first went to Iceland for 11 months, and then from Iceland I was shipped to Ireland. Stayed in Ireland for uh, Northern Ireland, because Southern Ireland was independent, and we couldn't uh, go to Southern Ireland because the Germans were there. The uh, Germans liked to go there for vacation, so that wasn't a, a place to go because uh, we would run into trouble. And uh, I don't know what we'd done if we'd gone to Southern Ireland and shot somebody. You might have been, we might have been charged with murder because they were uh, independent. They didn't join the war. Now, from Northern Ireland, I went into Watton Air Force Base, which was about five miles west of Norwich. And then I served the rest of the war there. Well, they, the English people couldn't be more graceful than they were. And in fact, they were so grateful that we were there that we had free of everything. Uh, if you wanted to go on trains, it was free. You could go anywhere. And uh, uh, even on an individual basis, we would be invited to homes uh, for dinner. And, uh, they, they were just so grateful that we were there. They were doing everything they could to make us happy. We were on a, a permanent RAF base. Uh, we had beautiful quarters that were brick buildings. Uh, and uh, we had apartments of our own. There were two of us per apartment, and uh, there was an upstairs apartment and a downstairs. There were two up and two down. And it was beautiful quarters. They just couldn't be any better. We, you know, we were supposed to be having a hard time during the war, and we weren't having a hard time at all. One of the unfortunate parts that I didn't like about it, I sat back and told other people what to do. And. Uh, I, I thought I'd rather be doing that myself than telling somebody else to do it. Uh, I'd got orders from uh, uh, Eisenhower's headquarters uh, about people coming to the base and what uh, they were to do and that we would uh, drop people behind the lines at night time. Uh, we did that several times. And we did that in order to save the bridge. We got them dressed in unit with the German uniforms to follow the Germans out. And they just made it so that they would be among the end. Uh, once that we uh, dropped into France, uh, I don't even know how many, but we dropped them and then what they did was to go in and as soon as they hit the ground to get their parachutes and bury them uh, so that uh, they could kind of disappear into the population. And that's what they did. And we got by with it. Oh, we were using B-17s all the time. That's all we had. We had a few 39s, 17s primarily. There were several. After they had completed what they were supposed to do, uh, we had arrangements that they would get into northern Africa and then we would pick, make sure that they got from Northern Africa back to us. And we did that. We brought them home. I was in intelligence. I carried out orders when I got them from Eisenhower's headquarters in London. Uh, they, uh, when they needed something done, uh, they would call me and it was up to me to get it done. I did so much, I can't even remember it all now. Vaguely, here, here's the, the, the biggest one. We had uh, hundreds of people waiting to invade Europe. Uh, they were just south of England and waiting for the go-ahead to, to go. And uh, the weather was very bad. And uh, uh, Eisenhower was trying to wait for better weather because uh, uh, we would more than likely get where we were going. But it didn't let up. So he took a chance and uh, told them to go anyway because we were getting high waves enough to uh, 
uh, they were difficult to get across. And uh, the whole group eventually got into France, but it wasn't without incident. There was a lot of trouble and, and a lot of people didn't make it uh, because of the, the weather. Uh, and the Germans had anticipated where we would come in. Uh, well, they had put in uh, objects in the ocean in order to uh, sink any boats. That is, if a boat came in, uh, a boat couldn't get over it uh, enough to uh, let the people get off and then get ashore. Uh, they had it well defended. Uh, we knew it, and we took as many precautions as we could. We lost a lot of men, but they eventually made enough people to got ashore that you know the end of the story. We made it. I got calls uh, regarding uh, what we should be doing, and uh, the Germans had anticipated that we would cross the channel much further north than we did. Uh, and they thought that they, uh, they had uh, pictures and a lot of evidence, and we, would, we didn't mind of people from the south, where they had photographed the gathering of the troops in the south to go, up, uh, to go uh, into France. And uh, they thought that was a, uh, a show of force that would distract them, and they expected us to go in from the north, northern England, straight across because it was a short distance. Hitler in, intended, uh, and he made them, keep the troops there in order to fight us when we went across there. And uh, enough so that uh, it made it much easier to get in than if they had uh, been trying to defend the southern part. But he insisted that this was just a bluff uh, at the south because then we had to go all the way through France in order to get to Germany. They thought we'd take the shortcut. Well, as you know, we didn't. The most notable thing that uh, happened, uh, the uh, Remagen Bridge, it was the last bridge over the Rhine River, and we were directed from Eisenhower's headquarters to do whatever we had to do to save that bridge. I went into London and picked up a, a German officer's uniform, which was, uh, and we could put any rank on it that we wanted to, so that we could outrank anyone else. And uh, <clears throat> we uh, uh, sent them to the bridge, and there were some Germans under the bridge. And uh, we had the person there that outranked them, so they ordered them to leave, and that when the Germans had retreated, uh, they would blow up the bridge. Well, the person that we sent under the bridge was dressed in a, a German uniform over his American uniform so that if he were detected, he wouldn't be killed. Uh, that was one of the rules uh, in war. And the Germans were very faithful about following the rules. <clears throat> so, um, In order to save the Remagen Bridge, we got the one officer and one private and put them in German uniforms and uh, sent them to retreat while the Germans were retreating. And uh, they went under the bridge and then uh, he had rank enough that he, the Germans that were under the bridge, uh, he ordered them to leave and these were Americans in German uniforms. They had German uniforms over the American uniforms, uh, and that they had to do that so they wouldn't be shot if they were caught. Uh, the Germans did follow the rules, and uh, our, our directions were to save that bridge, whatever we had to do. So uh, we had the two Americans in American uniforms that went under it and uh, ordered them to leave, and they did. They, we knew the rules, and, but they uh, 
outranked the Germans who were under it, uh, so that uh, it worked out as we had planned. Well, I went into London and picked up the German uniforms and put them on and uh, saved them at the base until the two Americans that spoke fluent German arrived and then we put them in the uh, German uniforms and they went under the bridge to save it uh, because we knew that the Germans intended to blow that bridge because it was the only bridge left over the Rhine River at the time. Everything went just exactly as we had planned it and uh, they got under the bridge, ordered them to leave and that they would uh, blow up the bridge as soon as the Germans retreated. Right. Well, they gave them about 20 minutes uh, after the last Germans crossed over the bridge, and then they went downstream and uh, set off an explosion so that they would get the impression that we had blown the bridge. But we didn't because we needed to save that bridge for the Americans uh, because trucks cannot go on pontoon bridges and we needed to save it for the trucks. Uh, Jeeps can go on pontoon bridges, but trucks can't. So uh, only Jeeps could go across on the pontoon bridges. And uh, everything worked as we had planned it. Uh, we saved the bridge, and we saved it for the uh, Americans, and that's the story. Hollywood doesn't have that story. I saw one Hollywood film where they had uh, GIs sitting on the bridge with machine guns shooting at some invisible target out there all the time. And there was not a, a GI in 50 miles of that bridge. They just made up a story to go with it. Just carrying out what I was supposed to do when I got directions from Eisenhower's headquarters in London, uh, I was a contact from in uh, uh, Watton, England, which was Watton Air Force Base near Norwich. Uh, and. Uh, we would send in uh, airplanes to do certain bombings that they told us to, and uh, then we'd send in photo recon afterwards to see if it was done, and if not, do it again. The seaports, and uh, uh, we bombed those enough that they were not usable, uh, and that uh, made it so that the submarines uh, had difficulty even finding a place to rest or get into. But, uh, and I think I have some of those pictures uh, where uh, we went in and uh, uh, it's just absolutely amazing when we look at all those potholes in the ground. In fact, after we had the photo recon uh, to go into uh, uh, all over, then they would bring the pictures back and we, as soon as they were developed, to uh, uh, see if it needed to be done anymore or... No, our feeling is that the whole nation was behind us. I mean, the whole nation was involved. If they weren't there, they were just as involved in being home and supporting us. Uh, that was a unanimous feeling. But anyway, I had served so long over there that I wasn't even considered to go to the other way. I wasn't anxious to get into another one. I thought somebody else could have a turn. Long after I was supposed to be home, I still wasn't. Uh, I had to wait uh, about four months, four or five months, I don't remember the exact number of days, uh, to, uh, to return to the States. But there were, what, six million of us over there. And it wasn't that easy to get them home. And uh, I came home on an aircraft carrier. I don't remember the name of it now. I'd have to think about that for a while. But uh, the aircraft carrier was great. Uh, we could play football on the deck, and uh, we had all kinds of fun coming home. I was there about four months uh, after the Germans surrendered. Well, there was about two weeks uh, that we waited for them to surrender after the war had ended. Uh, the Germans were having to get their act together because I guess they were trying to decide who was in charge because Hitler was, uh, had committed suicide, as you know, and uh, they didn't have their act together, so 
we had to wait until they got their act together, whoever took over. It's been too long ago now that I don't remember the names anymore. But they took over, and uh, then that's when the thing came to an end. I was in London at part of that time because I was only about 50 miles from London, and we had free transportation anywhere we wanted to go. And uh, there was a you know, big celebration in London, but uh, it was more the civilians that were celebrating than we were. <laughs> we were just anxious to get this thing over with so we could go home. We got into the docks and there wasn't a, a single person to welcome us home. And I thought that was unusual. I thought, you know, we expected, you know, some a band or something to be there. It was nothing. And uh, we got off the uh, boat, and then we were sent to, I don't know, some city of New Jersey to be discharged. I came back, and two weeks later, I entered UCLA and went to uh, stay at UCLA straight through for my MA and PhD education administration. And then I, from that one, I went to Singapore and uh, took over the American school that was there. And uh, it's still there. <laughs>